All right, so today we are looking at um, um, a very interesting opportunity. So we're looking at Singapore International Graduate um, Award, which is um, short, um, or short titled SINGA, um, with, uh, which is uh, an opportunity in Singapore. And I think it's a good one. And I so I, I just thought maybe I should share with with the with the community today on on this particular opportunity. So we'll dive in into it um, as quickly as possible. And when we are done, we'll take questions. We'll take questions on this and any other question that you may have uh, with respect to any other uh, scholarship opportunity as well. So um, let's go. So the overview of our presentation today, as usual, is that we're going to look at why you should think of Singapore as um, a destination for your you know, study. And then we'll look at um, understanding the Singapore International Graduate um, Award. And then we'll look at how you can apply for this opportunity. And then we'll round up with what you will need to apply for this opportunity. So for those who don't know me, uh, let me just quickly introduce myself to you. Um, my name is Ape Omede and I'm Nigerian and I'm, I'm currently living in, in Spain. So I'm um, a Maria Curia Fellow with an organization called Chagas, which is Agriculture and Food Development Authority of Ireland. Um, and I'm doing a visiting research um, work at the University of Leon in Spain. So usually I, I share a bit of uh, some of my um, my story or my achievements with um, with the audience or with people who usually usually join the webinar. And the reason why I do that is to um, encourage you to 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 know that it, I mean it's possible to actually win a scholarship, especially if you feel that maybe your result is not too good. Maybe you made a two one or a two two. Um, I didn't also make a first class. And I always say that it's not to talk down in you know, the first class. If you can make a first class, it will make things easier for you. But for those who are not able to make a first class, that doesn't mean that you're unable to, you will not be able to secure a scholarship. Because someone like me who didn't make a first class have gone ahead to win several um, opportunities. So I will just quickly share them with you. The first is that uh, in 2009 and 2011, I won the Alltech Young Scientist Award, which is uh, one of the most prestigious young scientists uh, competition in the world for people in, in sciences, in basically agricultural and natural and physical sciences. And this opportunity took me to the United States to present or to compete at the global phase representing Africa and Middle East. Um, I'm a three-time winner of the World Poetry Congress Young Scientist Award in 2008, 2012, and 2016. Uh, and all this gave me opportunity for an all expense paid trip to, to Australia, to China, and to Brazil. And in 2012, 2013, I won the University of New England International Postgraduate Research um, Scholarship, uh, as well as the International, International Postgraduate Research Award in the same university, which I used to complete my PhD um, in Australia. Uh, in 2014, I got the Hamlet Protein Industry Research Grant um, to support my research work at the University of New England. At the same time, too, I got um, the University of New England Seed Grant, which is about 20,000 um, Australian dollars at then. And like I mentioned, currently I'm a Maria Curia Fellow um, with, uh, with uh, Irish um, Agriculture and Food Development Authority. So a, a total amount of all these is about 400,000 um, US dollars. That's what I've um, won in, in grants, in scholarships and um, in awards. And not adding to the current one, which is close to 200,000 euros you know, for the Maya Career Fellow. So, um, it, I mean, it's possible for you to you know, have this kind of testimony if you are really, really serious and determined you know, to succeed. So this is my beautiful family. I'm married with um, four kids, and um, yeah, they they are just a bunch of beautiful people. And so this um, seminar is organized by Scholarship Mastery Academy. And for those who don't know Scholarship Mastery Academy, it's a platform that I've, I've started um, with the vision to help students become fit and ready to apply for scholarships. Now, there are a lot of people who are out there who are desirous of, you know, getting a scholarship, but for one thing or the other, they don't know how to go about it. 
or for one thing or the other, um, they don't even know that they are qualified to apply for you know a different kind of they, some of some of them are qualified, but they don't know how to apply for it. And uh, some of them who are not you know qualified need to put things in order you know, work on one or two things to become qualified to apply, but they don't know how to go about it. So in Scholarship Mastery Academy, what we do is to help students to become fit and ready um, for scholarships. And we do that through webinars like this. Um, every Saturday, we try to put up a webinar on a particular kind of scholarship or discuss things around scholarships. Sometimes it could be Q&A as well. Uh, and then we share opportunities, scholarship opportunities on uh, different um, social media platforms on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, in our Facebook group and on the page. And we also have a Telegram group where we share the opportunities as well. Uh, we have an online course, which um, has about nine modules and you know, a replace of all the webinars as well, that takes you through a different um, um, topics on scholarship publication. And then we also run a mentoring and a coaching program. So the, the webinar today is organized by Scholarship Mastery Academy. And so let's go straight into today's discussion and um, see what we can get out of it. So why should you study in Singapore? And um, I, I had the opportunity to transit in, in Singapore in last year, 2019, when I was uh, I traveled to Greece. So I had traveled from Australia to, to Greece, but transited in Singapore. And it was like, wow, I need I need to you know, plan a visit to Singapore. I've heard about Singapore for a long time before that time, um, but that was my first time of stepping in uh, my foot on Singapore. And even though I didn't, um, you know, go into the city to look at what it is like, but the little I saw around the airport, I know that showed that it's really a very, very beautiful city. Yeah, somewhere I think that I have in plan to maybe travel to for holiday or something like that in the future. So, so, but I, I, I would like you to know also that it's not just about the beauty. Um, Singapore offers a lot of opportunities for students to study. And these are some of the reasons why I think you should, um, you know, think of Singapore. Uh, first of all, the, the Singapore has about six, six, six um, public universities. There are several other universities that are there and that, uh, that are um, campuses of um, other universities in, in other parts of the world, but they have their campuses in, in, in Singapore. But I'm talking about universities that are owned by Singapore itself, you know, and there are about six of them. And out of those six, two of them are among the top 50 universities in the world, National University of Singapore and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore are among the top universities, top 50 universities in the world. And you can imagine a country that has six universities and out of that six, two, uh, you know, uh, up there. And there is, a, there is a Singapore management school as well that is among the top management schools in the world. So when you talk about quality of education or quality uh, the educational system in, in Singapore, I will really, really tell you that it, um, the educational system in Singapore is one of the best um, in the world and in, in, in Asia. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, there is a huge level um, amount of multicultural diversity in, in Singapore. Uh, it's an international hub for education, and so it attracts a lot of students from different parts of the world, especially because people who may not be able to go to a place like US or UK or Australia may find it more easy to go to, sing to, go to a, you know, a Singapore, a, a campus of a university in Australia or US or, or UK in Singapore because maybe the visa processing or cost of living and all that will be easier for them in Singapore. So um, instead of spending all the money going to US or Australia or Canada or UK, they will rather come to Singapore and still attend the same university in Singapore, get the same degree they would have gotten if they had gone to another, I mean, gone to the country, the original country of that particular university. So as a result, it attracts a lot of international people, students from all over the world um, to gather together just for the purpose of study in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is a very clean, clean and green and safe um, environment. I think I have heard and I've confirmed as well that in Singapore you cannot litter anything on the street, on the road, even in the, whether you are in the train or in the bus, wherever it is that you are, you can never ever drop any single thing on the ground or in the car, in the bus, anywhere at all. You are not permitted to do that. If you do that, you will run into trouble. 
and uh, that that will be tantamount to finding you some uh, amount of money. Uh, but it's safe compared to uh, several other Asian countries. And uh, from my research, it's one of the greenest or the greenest country, city in in um, in Asia. And crime rates are quite low in Singapore. Uh, next one is that um, Singapore um, is uh, is connected to many parts of the world because of its um, um, uh, Singapore Ch uh, Changi Airport, which is one of the one of the biggest airports in you know, about busiest airport in the world and one of the most beautiful airports in the world. So that means that if you really want to travel, if you're someone who loves to travel, you may also be able to travel um, even living in Singapore without having much difficulty uh, with um, access to transportation. Tuition fees are quite low, um, even if you go there without scholarship, but then there are a lot of scholarships actually in Singapore. There are several scholarships in, in, in Singapore and that are offered by either the government or the universities uh, there. But if you compare studying in, in Singapore to places like US or UK, uh, Canada and Australia, which are quite expensive, then it would be a cheaper option for you. And lastly, um, even though it's an Asian country, the, the language there is a bilingual country. And in most cases, I mean, uh, the language of instruction and business is English language. Like when I had my stopover in Singapore, I didn't have problem with, um, you know, communicating with some of the staff members at the airport there because everybody understood and spoke English. So there are a lot of other reasons, but um, I thought maybe this would be enough to um, you know, motivate you to think of us going to Singapore. So what is this SINGA award? What is this Singapore International Graduate Award all about? So let's just um, look at it quickly. First, this um, program is a collaboration between four institutions in Singapore, uh, Agency for Science, Technology and Research, Nanyang Technological University, uh, National University of Singapore, and Singapore University of Technology and Design. So these four institutions have come together to establish this International Graduate um, Award. And it is awarded to international students with excellent academic graduate, undergraduate and or master's results and strong interest in doing full-time research leading to a doctorate degree in science and engineering at any of the at a Singapore at those four four institutions over a period of four years. So one, it is an international student um, scholarship uh, program. Uh, it is for PhD students, and it is mainly in in science and engineering. And the award is only tenable at these four institutions that are partnering together to you know um, establish uh, the the award. So and that, what it means is that when you're applying for this program, you have to choose um, one of these institutions for your, um, your study program. Uh, so it is awarded two, two times each year, uh, first in January and uh, second in August, with close to 250 awards given every year. So for this year, um, uh, the first award should have been would have been given by now because we are already in November. Uh, so the Nove the August set closes by June, and the January set closes by Gen uh, by December of the of the previous year. But interestingly, for this year, um, probably because of COVID and all that, it's been shifted to January next year, first of January next year. So um, that is why it is an opportunity that you can still take even um, at the moment. Two, two times in the year, January and in August. And it is a no bond um, uh, program. And what it means is that it does not require you to go back to your country so long as you're able to um, uh, get a, a, a visa that allows you to continue to stay. Um, and then it does not also require you to pay back anything if you eventually decide to stay on like some scholarships like the us aid scholarship you know if you get the us aid scholarship you have to sign a bond and that bond means that you have to go back after your study um, and if you decide not to go back you have to pay back all the money that was you know paid to you um, while you're taking on that um, scholarship program but um, this particular scholarship is uh, a no bond scholarship and doesn't require all that and I mean, one thing I didn't mention on why you should think of Singapore is that the student visa in Singapore allows you to work. Um, it allows you to work up to 16 hours 
uh, during school, when the school is in session and uh, unlimited hours when the school is on break. But um, unfortunately, this particular scholarship, um, SINGA does not allow you to work while holding this scholarship. So um, because it's a full-time scholarship program, full-time research scholarship program, you're expected to work full-time on your scholarship and on your research, you're not allowed to work um, while holding the scholarship. And it is a two-step application process, uh, meaning that first of all, you have to submit uh, your application with uh, possibly a project proposal. Uh, and then if your application scales through the first round of assessment, you'll be invited for an interview, which uh, would be con conducted uh, virtually over Skype or Zoom. So as at last year, as at last year, about 29,000 applications have been received so far from different countries, from uh, over 170 countries, uh, about 29,000 um, applications. So this is quite a huge um, uh, uh, scholarship program. But interestingly, almost 900, uh, more than 950 awards have been given um, as at last year. 950 scholarships have been given. So, it, I mean, thinking of uh, um, close to 250 in a year, that's a very big opportunity, actually. And there are nearly applications from uh, more than, I mean, the 950 awardees were from almost um, 100 different countries all over the world. So, the research area for this particular scholarship is number one, sciences. You have to be studying or interested in sciences. Uh, by either biomedical sciences or physical sciences for you to be able to um, um, uh, take up this opportunity. And then secondly, if you're also uh, interested in engineering, you will be able to um, take up this uh, opportunity. And there are over 70 research institutes um, and um, areas that have um, several hundreds of uh, projects so the, the, the way it is, it is, is that there are, there are several projects in over 70 research institutes across the four institutions that you can choose from. Because when you're applying for this, you have to first of all identify um, a project, uh, make a contact with a potential supervisor, and then um, get an agreement before you go ahead to apply. So even though it, the, the um, I mean, the areas is just looking like a science and engineering, it is actually very broad. When I looked at it, I saw several areas that um, a lot of people can try, you know, so it's quite a broad, a broad um, a research area um, program. So um, it, it, I don't want you to be limited by me just putting on sciences and engineering. There, there's different aspects of sciences that you're going to see when you go into, um, you know, looking at that. And 70 research institutes are involved, more than 70 research institutes with over several, hun several hundreds of projects available for you to attempt. Uh, so you will need to contact a potential supervisor from those research institutes to discuss your interest with them. But this uh, scholarship does not sc support MBAs and it doesn't support PhD programs in humanities or finance or business or management or architecture. So if you, if you are in humanities, finance, business, management, uh, architecture, or you're interested in MBA, this may not be for you. So what are the eligibility criteria for this program? And it's quite simple. I um, Sincerely, I think that this is a, a very simple and scholarship program. Um, so the most important thing is that you have to, to be interested in, in a research career. So you are an international student, you're passionate um, about science and engineering research. Uh, you have excellent academic, academic qualifications, but then they didn't mention what, they, there was no definition of what an excellent academic qualification is. In the in the program, good reports, academic report, referees uh, report from your, your whoever you that, that you're going to select as a referee, and the fluency in English is um, is encouraged. But interestingly, it doesn't require GRE. That's why I say this is one of the easiest scholarship programs I've seen. Actually, you don't need a GRE. You don't need an IELTS. Um, your English language skill will be assessed during the interview. So I mean. That's just uh, that's just it. And then the selection criteria. So these are a few things that they will be looking at when they are selecting the, the you know, potential applicants to to 
to award, to award this particular program. So your academic record will be looked at, your publication records will be looked at, recommendations from your academic um, referees um, will be looked at, your personal achievements will be looked at, um, your passion and ability to excel in research will be looked at, and if you meet all these things, then an interview will be, you'll be shortlisted for an interview. So um, my advice for this is that if you have, if you have um, publications in, in journal articles, in conference papers, in book chapters, in online magazines, you have any of these, you have to include them in your, in your application. Um, when you're picking your referees, pick referees who understand your academic strength and even beyond your academic strength to your personal ability uh, and are able to, you know, um, put that down effectively in writing for someone who is assessing you. Then your personal achievements, and again, this is not clear, clearly defined, defined on what they mean by personal achievement. So as, mu as much as your mind can go, as much as you can think, you know, that is a personal achievement for you. You can include it in your um, application, and then passion and ability to excel in research um, will will be assessed. There was no mention of submitting a research proposal, but I assume that there would be um, a stage where you may need to submit a research proposal because this, this is a purely a research based program. And even though that um, research topics have been listed by the potential supervisors that you're going, that you're going to con con, you know um, um, contact. It, it, it is likely that they may ask you to write something as well. So, uh, because that's the only way they may be able to assess your ability um, to excel in research, even though your publications is an indicator of your ability to excel in research, but then being able to write up a concept note or a short proposal may be um, one of the ways to show that. And so your academic records, your uh, publications, uh, recommendation letters from your academic referees, uh, personal achievements, and then your, your, your ability to do research is, um, Will be will be looked at and eventually you'll be invited to an interview. So what is covered um, by Singer? So the award provides uh, four years of funding for your PhD studies, which includes your your school fees. Your school fees is totally covered by the um, program, and then you receive a monthly stipend of two thousand two thousand Singaporean um, of the Singaporean dollars. And it will increase to 2,500 when you pass your qualification um, exam because it, it, uh, I think it is, it is done in Australia as well. When you are a PhD student, you do what is called confirmation of candidature, which is done usually um, six months into your, into your PhD. If you are fast, you can do it three months at, uh, into your program, four months, five months. It depends on how fast you are in setting up everything you need. As soon as you're ready, you do your confirmation of candidature. I think that's what they mean here also by qualifying exams. Looks like you have to um, do a kind of a, a confirmation of your candidature. And then if you pass that confirmation, they will increase the, the, the monthly stipend to 2,500 Singaporean um, dollars. And as of today, 1,000 Singaporean dollars is about 750 US dollars. So that is about 1,500 US dollars. So if you convert it, you know it's a lot of money. And then you have a one-time FA grant of about 1,500 Singaporean dollars, and also a relocation allowance of 1,000 Singaporean dollars. So this is, this is just beautiful. This is just beautiful. I mean, I will encourage everyone who is qualified or eligible to you know, go for this. So how do you apply for this uh, program? So all applications are actually done online. So you, you, there's no physical materials and it's, it's, it's even static, uh, stated categorically um, that if you submit a physical document, it will not be accepted. So all applications and supporting documents are done online at um, ASTAR scholarship application portal. And that's the link to the portal. The portal is um, at um, app dot a for um, um, uh, dash star dot edu dot sg forward slash sms forward slash applicant forward slash login dot aspx so if you go to this link you will be able to um, submit um, your application and when you go there this is what it looks like so it's a very simple um, portal or platform where um, you will need to create an account um, to be able to log in. So 
uh, down there you will see uh, down here you will see where you do, you create you you create an account or you register um, an account and then uh, you come back and log in with your details to get um, into the portal to you know start your application. So what will you need to apply for this? Uh, so first of all, you need to browse through the research um, project to select a project in your area of interest and then make a contact with the contact person or contact researcher potential supervisor in that particular project. That's the first and the most important thing. To, if you have an agreement with, with a potential supervisor, it makes it a lot more easier for you to you know, continue to get supported all through the application process. And then when you do that, you need to prepare and upload um, the following um, documents and they are compulsory. Um, if you miss any of them, um, it will affect your application. It was stated categorically clear that they are compulsory documents. First one is your international passport. Uh, so as a matter of fact, I always tell guys at, at the scholarship show that if you are talking about studying abroad and you don't have an international passport, you are not ready yet. Um, I, I got my first international passport in two, 2006 or thereabouts when I was doing my national youth service. And um, I didn't get my first scholarship until 2012-2013. No, but then I used that international passport to, to enjoy some travel grants, like the, the, the travels to the US that I showed you and, uh, and the rest. So um, you may not need it immediately for a scholarship, but I mean, having it at hand saves you a lot of trouble. I mean, you don't want to start rushing up and down. Well, uh, helter skelter when it is time to apply for scholarship because you're looking for how to get an international passport just get it and keep and if you don't have a scholarship you can look for other opportunities to travel for conferences and all that and continue to build your network uh, towards uh, get, getting a scholarship so but for this you need an international passport you need a passport photograph a recent passport photograph you need your academic transcripts you need your certificate, your first degree academic transcript, first degree certificate. And if you don't have your first degree certificate ready, you can get a letter from your, your university to say that you have completed your program, but the degree has not been conferred or the certificate has not been um, um, awarded. And the same goes with your master's transcript as well and your master's degree certificate. You need to um, get them and um, uh, if you don't have your master's certificate ready, you need to do the same thing as well. Um, then you need to get recommendation letters from two academic referees that they will be able to submit themselves online. And the transcript, it didn't say whether the transcript should be certified or not, but usually I encourage people in Scholarship Mastery Academy to certify their documents um, just for the benefit of that, certify your document um, and scan and send. Make sure you always send a certified document. It saves you a lot of um, trouble. And to continue, so uh, uh, this is not compulsory, but it was encouraged if it is available. So if you don't, if you don't have them, there is no problem. But if you have them, um, you can add them on um into your application and it, it is not going to be used as part of your assessment whether you have these or not so don't be don't be scared or afraid or discouraged if you don't have them they are just saying that if you have them submit them no problem they will just look at it and okay tick you off as by okay you're able to um, speak good i mean you you don't have problem with english you know um, but if you don't have them that means during your interview part of the assessment will be your ability to communicate you know, very well in English. So if you have a GRE um, um, result or IELTS or TOEFL, SAT 1 or 2 or GET results, um, it will be good if you submit them along with your application. So the deadline for this scholarship is, to, is the 1st of January, 2021. 1st of January, 2021, that's um, um, about 30 days from, is it? Uh, no, more, about 40 days from today or thereabouts. 40, 39 days from today. It's a long time. It's a long time to be able to get in touch with those guys um, and uh, see, get someone to agree to support your application. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. So 
um, I will encourage you to start today. So and now when you log into the application portal, you must there are there are other scholarship programs that are there. So you must make sure that you you are selecting the right one. And for this one, it is the Singapore International Graduate Award. So that's what you'll be um, looking for um, when you go into the application portal. So I think that that's all about this um, program, Singapore International Graduate Award. And um, if you have any question, um, let's talk about them quickly before we round up. And if you're joining on Facebook, I'll also be able to uh, to see your questions. You can ask from here, and uh, we'll pick it up as well. So Yerinde is raising his hand. Um, okay, so if you can type your question into the chat, if you don't mind, you can type your question into the chat box. I can pick it from there. Um, uh, if you have any question on Facebook, you can also type it in the comment section. Oh, Irinde, your background is noisy, so you can type your question in the chat. Um, that's the only option I would give. Unless your background is clear, then you can ask your question. If not, type it in the chat. I'll pick it up from there. Okay, there's a question here. It seems this scholarship is only for a PhD. Yes, so the sing singer um, program is um, is for PhD um, uh, students. Uh, specifically, it's written for PhD students in on the website. Unfortunately. I'm waiting for your questions. If your background is clear, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. But if your background is not clear, please, um, you, it will be better you type it in into the comments uh, chat section. That would be better so that we don't disturb everybody on the. OK, so. Um, I applied last year and I was declined. I need to figure out why so I can improve on it. Well, um, I don't know why you were declined because um, uh, um, I wasn't there. So did you get any feedback? Did you get any feedback? So what was the feedback? If your background is clear, you can unmute and talk to me. Are you, are you in there? Hello. Yeah, hello. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. I really want to appreciate. Yeah, I want to appreciate your efforts in giving us enough information about Singer Scholarship. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. So I applied last year mm -hmm. and I saw a project that really fits into my area of interest. Yeah. I'm a thermodynamic engineer. Mm -hmm. So I have interest in uh production of biodiesel from from agricultural waste. So yes. I saw a research on that, though I'm not thinking maybe it's because I don't have publication. Mm -hmm. I only have a conference paper uh, in Minnesota, USA that mm -hmm. I presented. That's the only academic publication that I have, but I don't have a journal. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what could be responsible. Like now, I know I'll be applying for some scholarship yeah. early last year, next year again. Mm -hmm. So I've started preparing for GRE. But reading or listening to you, you said GRE is not even graded. That yes. just only really show I'm a proficient user of English. Yes. So I'm just considering maybe I should throw away uh, GRE examination. I shouldn't bother myself again. <laughs> <laughs> but I see, I'm still trying to figure out that what difference okay. can I make okay. in my application this year yes. to improve on my chances of getting the scholarship next year. Okay, so um, number one, don't um, give up on GRE. Don't, uh, don't, if, you if you have registered for it, don't give up on GRE. I always tell um, uh, people on, uh, on the scholarship show, 
any test you can take and keep, put it in your pocket, I will advise you to do that because you never can tell where and when that will be needed or when that will be important. Uh, but for this particular scholarship, for single scholarship, um, GRE, TOEFL, SAT, and all that are not, are not graded. They are not compulsory and they're not part of the assessment. The core things that are used to assess you are these things that we have mentioned here. Let me quickly see if I can go back to them again and try to highlight and the selection criteria. Uh, selection criteria, okay, so, so these are the selection criteria that they are looking at. If you ask me, if you ask me, I will say, like you mentioned, that one of the things that may have disqualified you is your publications. Um, now, because it's a publication-based, a research-based um, scholarship, a lot of people who have, who have experience in research will, will apply for it, or who are interested in research and have been working in research, I will apply for it. And eventually, they will rank you guys based on your number of publications. I will use myself as an example, and it is the same with all research-based and scholarship. When I first applied for my scholarship some years ago, I had about, I think I had about seven or eight um, articles, both, both, um, both journal publications and the conference conference papers, about seven or eight there about. And luckily for me, I started publishing early because I had a very, I had a very good uh, first degree supervisor and master's degree supervisor. So he, he put me through publications and all that. So I think I had maybe uh, eight, seven or eight, I can't remember exactly. And then when I got the feedback, uh, from my supposed to be supervisor, then uh, he told me that it is likely that why I didn't get that scholarship was because my publications were not much because they will rank everybody based on your number of publications. And so what I did from that time till the next time I applied was to make sure I put I put effort into publications. And in fact, I've mentioned this severally in the in the in the in the show to everybody who has been coming to this make sure you you are committed to your publications, make sure or committed to your publication. So I started publishing. And by the time I applied again, I think I was ranked second. Only one person had more publications than me for that particular year, and I was able to get it. So uh, it is very, very possible that um, um, one of the reasons why you didn't get it is, is was because your publication number uh, was um, low. So um, you need to, you need to, I mean, I don't know what you've done from that time till now, but if you have papers, I will advise you that between now and January, submit them. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have them published to, to put them in your CV. If you, have, if you have submitted them and you have evidence of submission of those papers, you can include them in your CV and in, the front, in front of each of the publication, you can just write submitted whether it is conference, and then if you have attended other conferences since then, you have to also include them. And then don't limit your publications to journal and conferences. If you have, uh, if you've made a contribution to magazines in your area of, of expertise, and whether it is an online magazine or physical magazine, so long as it has to do with a, a, a research discussion or a review of a particular issue or a particular topic in your area of interest, and it's been published, include them in your, in your CV. Don't leave any stone unturned. Um, then your, ref your, your referees also are very, I mean, the recommendations from your referees needs to be also very, very strong. I may not be able to talk much about that because I don't know who your referee is where, um, but you must be able to pick people who can write excellently about you. I mean, people who understand you, your, 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 what, what it is you're looking after, and are able to you know, put it down like I mentioned initially. So your referees are very, very key also in, in um, you being able to secure a scholarship. Personal achievements. Have you won any award? Have you won any grant? Have you contributed to anything at all? Have you produced anything? Is there anything you have, you feel this is an achievement that I can claim to have, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, have um, achieved in my life? You need to put it, don't, don't take anything for granted. It may be something small and you think that it's not very important. For example, I think I mentioned this before. Um, this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm currently on a, on a fellowship, on a Marie Curie fellowship. And when I was applying for it, I included a particular role that I'm currently on now. And that role requires me to be a kind of a CEO of an innovation 
um, my, uh, hub in, in Nigeria. And do you know that when I got my review, my review, you know, from, from the reviewers, when I got my feedback from the reviewers rather, I saw that one of the reasons why I got, I mean, they scored me high on a particular topic. I can't remember exactly which of the, which of the scale, but they scored me high on it. And one of the comments they made was that he has, he has leadership experience and he is leading, he is involved in an innovation hub or something like that, relating to what I have included in my CV. It never occurred to me that okay, this thing will be will be relevant in this particular program I'm applying for. But then, because of my my the way I see things, this is this is how I see things. I don't actually leave anything on on. I mean, any any stone on turn. That anything that I feel that is important in my life, I put it in there. So including that alone was one of the reasons why my score went high, and I eventually got you know the the fellowship position. So what it is that you what is it that you've done with your life? Have you had a leadership position uh, in student association, student organization? You were part of a conference organizing committee. Um, I mean, think of whatever it is you've and put them in there. Um, yeah, so uh, these are a few things that I feel may be, may be the reason why you did not get. And then maybe your interview, I'm not sure how, you, how well you did. But one thing I can say is that um, you don't have to give up. You you have to keep trying um, and trying and trying. And I can assure you that it's quite very possible for you to get to get it again. So that's all I can say to you, Yerinde, and then encourage you to try again. Any other person has any other question? Do we have any other question? Okay, I think there is a comment. Oh, you're welcome, Irinde. You're you're welcome. Okay, so um, I'll move on if there are no other questions, so that we can round up. And uh, if you want to stay back for our family meeting, you can stay back and we will talk a little bit more about other things um, uh, beyond the, the singer program. Okay, so um, if you want to join Scholarship Mastery Academy uh, to get more support with your scholarship applications, um, you, can, you can get in touch and we will let you know how we can be in, in of help to you in your scholarship application. Um, it is not a free service, but um, yes, if, if you are interested in it, you can get in touch and we can help you. We have an online course and we have a coaching and mentoring program um, that you can be part of if you are interested. All right, so that's it. And then the scholarship success challenge for December will start on the 1st of December. And um, as of today, we are on day 21 of Scholarship Success Challenge, and I'm really excited about it. And uh, I've seen the guys put a lot of effort into it. I mean, and some of them have really, really improved in, 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 their, in their journey towards you know, getting a scholarship. Uh, I'm, ex I'm excited that I have that opportunity to be able to you know, guide and share a little bit more with them and all that. And um, in the next 10 days, we will be rounding up with November um, edition. And my goal is that by the end of the, of the challenge, that all of them will be able to confidently write a good CV, write a good research proposal, um, write a good personal statement, write a good motivation letter, know how to find any scholarship anywhere in this world on any website know how to contact a potential supervisor. All these things we have covered in the Scholarship Success Challenge. And what we do is when we teach on a particular topic, we give a task on that particular topic that you have to carry out on that day. So if we teach a motivation letter, you have to write a demo motivation letter to show that you understood that particular. So the, ch the challenge is you actually taking action every day, every day on on something that is relevant to scholarship application. So um, if you're interested, you can, you can enroll for December. 
I've gotten a few people's enroll, enroll, enrollment already, and uh, we're going to get in touch with them um, uh, when we are ready to, to start you know, making contact with them. So if you're interested, 1st of December, the 30th of December could be your, your transformational month. I mean, you, you could use those days to um, prepare yourself for 2021 scholarship opportunities. And there are scholarships that people are saying because of COVID, there is no scholarship. I tell you that even because of COVID, there are much more scholarships. So don't let anybody deceive you with um, uh, COVID and that because of COVID, there is no scholarship. If you're interested in joining the challenge for December, go to the link that is showing on the screen and then register your interest or you can send a WhatsApp message to the number on your screen and you will get a feedback on how to go about it. So I look forward to seeing you in December um, for the Scholarship Success Challenge. And then some guys in the Scholarship Success Challenge are interested in GRE body program. That is why we started this now. Some of them are preparing to sit for GRE and they feel that having a group of people to study together um, will help will help them. So I said, okay, fine, it's good. It's, it's a good idea and we can create that. And so we, we thought we would just start a body program for GRE you know, exams. So if you are planning to take GRE between now and January or February or March next year, you can register and this is a free support program. It is not a paid program, at least for now, it is, it is free. And it's a peer, peer to peer support group where you meet other people who are planning to sit for GRE and you study together, you share ideas together, um, you share materials together and help each other, you know, to become successful in your GRE exam. So we want to make sure that by, by December, where we kick off the body program so that there'll be enough time to, to study. So if you're interested in joining, uh, just go to the link that is showing on your screen and, and then fill the form. There is a form there you have to fill and they will get back to you. There are a few people who have already done that. We hope that more people will uh, sign up so we can have a good number of people to, to start the body program with. And we want to make sure that by 30th of November, we have everybody on board. And so don't wait till, I mean, you know, the last day, if you have to do it, you just do it today or tomorrow. Um, so we'll be waiting to see, to, to get your application for that or your registration rather. And then if you're unable to join Scholarship Mastery Academy or join the uh, 30 Day Scholarship Success Challenge, you will still be able to have access to free stuff that we, we share, like the webinar that we are on now. And then uh, through Facebook, we share a lot of materials once in a while. Uh, our Telegram group is very, very, is very active as well. And we're on, on Twitter and on LinkedIn as Scholarship Mastery Academy. So if you search for Scholarship Mastery Academy, on any of the platforms, you should be able to find um, find us and you can join and continue to receive um, some free stuff. So thank you very much for joining today and um, we'll be back again next week. And uh, within the week, I will let you know what we'll be discussing for next week, Saturday, but I'm very happy and excited that you were able to join today. And I hope you'll be able to join us again next week. So, that is where we come to the end of today's presentation.